we're discussing failed promises bridging the north-south gap. And with us in discussion are uh, Mr. Yabwabing Asamwa, spokesperson for Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, the 2012 uh, running mate for Nana Dudan Kwekufado. And also, Anthony Abaifa Kabo, the national youth organizer of the New Patriotic Party. Well, it all started um, in the second term of the Kufu administration. The government then passed the, the Northern Development uh, Act and then paid 25 million Ghana cities into a fund that was supposed to, to be used in bridging the gap between the North and the South, in making sure that the North was developed into mm -hmm. um, a food basket for not only the Ghanaian market, but for the West African sub-region. And then further on into the 2008 campaign, the then um, uh, candidate for the MPP, Nanado Dankwe Kufuado, promised what he called the Northern Development Authority, further expanding the basket for the fund and lifting it to $1 billion. After the announcement, then vice presidential candidate, Mr. John Dramani Mahama, made a public statement that if the NPP could raise a billion dollars to support the Northern Development Authority, we should first of all pay uh, the debts that were incurred by the VRA. Two weeks later, the NDC launched what, we, what has, uh, you know, we know in political parlance today as the Saravana Accelerated Development Authority, simply called SADA, and promised that an initial sum of 200 million was going to be paid in the first year, and in subsequent years, 100 million was going to be paid into the SADA account. Three years or four years down the line, monies that have been um, paid into the SADA account still do not add up to 100 million Ghana cities. Today in discussion, I first of all go to Kabul. Um, the party has held uh, certain fora in the north. Uh, Nanado Dankwe Kufuado spoke extensively on his, his plans for the north at the youth forum in Tamale a couple of weeks ago. And then also over the weekend, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia spoke extensively still about the northern development program that the MPP was going to implement uh, if given the nod during the 2012 elections. Kabo, you are a son of the soil. You are from the north and uh, happen to be the national youth organizer of the MPP at the same time. This is about your backyard. Well, um, I thank you very much. And I, I think that, uh, let me first of all say a big thank you to the crew on the minority side of the party, of the party for holding this platform very effectively. I believe that it's been one of the most important political platforms where we're able to communicate with the country effectively. But um, like you, you rightly said, I guess that um, we come from the North. And of course, the North has always been uh, a major issue for us to, to engage with. And I personally have been very disappointed. And I made this point during the Northern Students' Union uh, 48th Congress in, in Bolgatanga over the weekend, that um, as Northern politicians, we must be very disappointed in the progress that we've made right from independence. But to a large extent, I believe that the problem of nodding under development cannot be prescribed after the post-colonial era. It is, in fact, right down through the colonial times, you've had you know, the mentality of having the North to be the hub of labor reserve, especially when many years after the export-based economy was well established in the South, where you know export of gold and cocoa and many industries have been expanded. If you, if you go back to the historical antecedents, you would, it, it would be interesting to note that many years after the South had even established educational facilities, the North was still reeling. And at the time, for the three northern regions, you had the, uh, the Tamale Secondary School, Tamasco today as people call it, which was the only institution that existed to provide education for many more people. And what is even more striking at the time is that you realize that many of those who had the opportunity to go to school were either children of the chiefs who were then part of the Northern Territorial Council. And so 
the colonial period, they wanted people who could interpret, mm -hmm. you know, they translate. And for that matter, the princes, the, the children of the chiefs at the time had the opportunity. And with the existence of the missionaries, had opportunity to take advantage of formal education. And so the gap between the North and the South in terms of education is well over 100 years. The first graduate that came out of the, the North was way after the South had churned out many graduates yeah. from our educational system that were well established because of the missionary work that had taken major prominence in the South and the exploits of the colonial masters at the time. And so, Perry, we, we have a, a chronic problem of nodding underdevelopment. And, and, and therefore, you will recall that even in the Nkrumah time, before independence, when the whole country or the whole Gold Coast at the time was edging for independence, there were people in the North really didn't catch the feel of independence at the time. I do recall that, you know, a lot of the chiefs came together and when they had to append their signature to the Declaration of Independence, because at the time, the colonial masters or the, the queen insisted that independence will not be handed over to the, the Gold Coast until it was with the consent of the chiefs. And so in Kurma, J.B. Dankwa and the rest all who were working, you know, to get, were, were working very closely with the chiefs. The chiefs of the North made a very important point at the time. And I do remember per the history that we've, 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 we've studied indicates that the then Yana of the Dagbon Kingdom made a very important point that it was important that the, the, the colonial masters brought the North up to speed in terms of development, education, uh, infrastructure before we could be talking about independence. He likened the situation to three pregnant women, one who was pregnant for nine months, the other for six months, and the other for three months, and said that, look, the North is like the three-month-old three, three months old pregnant woman. Mm -hmm. If you say she should be, give birth today, they're not going to give birth to a human being. Mm -hmm. But the South was almost like the nine months, and so they would give birth to you. It was because adequate preparations were made for the South at the time to demand independence. So the feeling for independence didn't really catch up with the North like that. Mm -hmm. And so the Nkrumah administration, mm -hmm. in fact, put together with the, with the consent of the colonial masters that 10 million pounds at the time was supposed to be invested in the North for Northern development. So it has not been today we are talking about Northern, Northern development and the commitment of the people. The question that we've been asking ourselves, and many people are very quick to make this analysis about this in Kuruma's free education, making it look like it was then meant for that. The North itself was supposed to be a protectorate for the colonial masters and a reserve for labor to feed the export industry that was well established in the South. And so you observe that many of the people who were working in the colonial uh, authorities in the South as uh, clerks, as messengers, as watchmen, were all from of Northern descent. They didn't get any good education. And so it was important to take education up as a serious matter in the North. And so all these investments were being done. You see, it is important that Northern historians and Northern politicians must begin to demand an audit of how that 10 million pounds was used. Even today, mm -hmm. how much is 10 million pounds if you throw that in, a lot, in, in a lot of money at the time? And so those are the kinds of gaps that we are having. So we could blame the gap also on the colonial administration mm -hmm. and also on our own politicians because they failed to make a giant step. The issue about Northern development, I grew up in Tamale, born in Tamale and realized that there was a gradual collapse of the traditional northern economy, which was largely agrarian. Many people involved in agriculture, because about 60 or 80 percent of the entire population of the north, indeed, are, are, are peasant farmers. And these are peasant farmers who are largely driven by rain-fed agriculture. And so minus climatic conditions, you know, it was going to be difficult for them to make a living. And so the MPP, and, many, and, and I would even want to fast forward, let's go a bit forward and think about other economies. One of the biggest things that has been a cause for a lot of strife and conflict in many West African states and Africa as a whole has been the disparity in development, especially between the growth poles. If you have the growth pole in the south, the yawning gap the between yawning the north. Gap. And that continues to present as a major danger, a challenge for this country if we want any economic stability. You cannot continue to concentrate investments in the south and expect them not to catch up in a way when you pay lip service. And so, interestingly, at the Northern Territorial Council, and I'm telling you today for your listeners to know, the first person to submit to the Northern Territorial Council a proposed budget, which was supposed to take care of Northern development, 
was Alaji Mumuni Baumia. He was among the, one of the first educated people in the North. And in 1953, he made a seminal presentation at the Northern Territorial Council on behalf of the chiefs that it was important that the, the colonial administration took cognizance of the gap and so led to the creation of the Northern People's Party, which was largely to get some political clouds and push for Northern development at the political level. So those were the concerns. And so Nana Kufuado, many years after 1953, comes back to a very important fact that, look, if we do not take a giant step, if we do not begin to focus or target development in strategic areas of the North, like agriculture, infrastructure, education, health, and opening up businesses, that, and especially making sure that the private sector, if you're looking for educated people in Ghana, you would, you would observe that majority of the people who saw early education, even up to now, in our country. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you. You should. Uh, but um, an unprecedented presentation of history about the North and its developments. Cabo, well, back to you. So, so Perry, this, this has been the trajectory of development for the North, as far as the history is concerned. Mm -hmm. So we are here in 2012, and we are talking about the giant steps that are supposed to be made to open up the north. Mm -hmm. If government does not focus on targeting development mm -hmm. in strategic areas of the north, we are going to have a difficulty. And this yawning gap is going to be coming. Mm -hmm. I was very disappointed in the vice president, mm -hmm. you know, now vice president, candidate at the time, when he made that unfortunate comment about Akufuado should take that one billion he's talking about for the North to pay the VRA debt. The question we should ask ourselves today is that, has the VRA debt been cleared? It, it hasn't. Mm -hmm. And we do know that they are reeling with huge debts. But if you go back to the crust of what we're talking about, we're talking really about giant steps opening up the North. And the Northern Development Authority that Nana Akufuado was talking about was to make agriculture the fulcrum of that policy. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they were going to have mechanized agriculture. Look, we grew up to see a lot more combined harvesters packed in people's houses, tractors packed in people's houses, and very ordinary civil servants at the time were largely engaged in agriculture, which were providing at least additional income for household expenditures. But today, we are seeing a decline in that. If you look at the service industry in the north, it's totally collapsed. You're not seeing anything like that. And what is even more scary, and I think that we've all been caught in the same trap, Perry, we are educated in the north, and now we are having to move to the south, where even the opportunities are, are gradually you know, being limited yeah. in your own words. Mm -hmm. And so we are, in, we are in a conundrum. We're here, a pool of labor from the north mm -hmm. that is supposed to go back and impact positively on the people. Mm -hmm. We are all stuck up in the south because mm -hmm. of opportunities. Mm -hmm. If government does not reverse that trend and get all of us here who are in the south, who are mm -hmm. competing with opportunities for, in, in the south with like Wabing and Co, who have a birthright to be here, and my school and educated here and get jobs here and have a livelihood here, we're all going to be stuck up here and we'll keep the north. And what is even more scary is the unprecedented movement, rural urban migration mm -hmm. from young people in the north. Look at, go to Malata Market, go mm -hmm. to Nima, go to Ashaima, go to Agbogoloche, go to all clusters around the country. Mm -hmm. You would observe that about 70% of the inhabitants in those little slums all have their antecedents back home. Imagine all of those people are having a reason to go because government has to push a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. And that is why Nanaku Fuado was talking about his $1 billion investments. And largely that was supposed to open up the north, that was supposed to invest in education, that was supposed to invest in agriculture, that was supposed to expand in health infrastructure, that mm -hmm. was supposed to create an environment that would be conducive to promote a private-led economy in the north and also a restoration of the lost traditional northern economy. Make agriculture a, a priority for the people. Make it productive. And look, what is even interesting is that the, the, the north is located in a very unique place where we could even be a major hub for the rest of, the, the, Sahelian rest of the Sahelian region. You're talking region. about Cote d'Ivoire, you're, you're talking about Burkina Faso, you're talking about Mali, Mali Niger. you're talking about Niger, yeah. and Chad, and all of, all of those places. And it is so interesting how you find out that there are no economic uh, 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 crops that can be promoted for mm -hmm. export. And it's important that these kinds of investments will open up the space. And so if you situate all of that analysis in the context of what Nana is talking about, the free education, 
the biggest beneficiary of the free education policy are the people of the north. Mm -hmm. Because majority of the people who are unable to get access to education, largely because their parents do not have the money, they are in the poverty zone, mm -hmm. and what is even scary and so dishonest, our politicians, and sometimes I do say our technocrats, is the fact that they have attended workshops, seminars, events, conferences, prescribed various solutions to open up the North and to put in investments. All those kinds of research work and conclusions and communiques are stuck yeah. up in On the government books. offices mm -hmm. and gathering dust. Akufuado and Abaumia are saying that, look, we are prepared to take up those recommendations. We are prepared to take up the work of all these our intellectuals and technocrats mm -hmm. and begin to put that into some action. And, and it is work. important that that will be the fulcrum of creating a lot more jobs for young people. Mm -hmm. I would wish mm -hmm. that I grew up in, or my children will grow up in Laura, school in Laura, get university education in the University for Development Studies, mm -hmm. find decent jobs. I made a very important point, and I'll end by that. My father used to tell me about the good old days. And by their, by, by their own understanding, the good old days meant that you went to school, you came out of the university, and companies were waiting to, um, to sort of recruit you and give, give them bungalows, okay? Give them cars, good jobs, security, and if you are lucky, a brand new wife. We want those good old days Back, back in our time. <laughs> and that is why the youth wing of the MPP uh -huh. is calling for a radical policy shift. And we are going to push the MPP and the leadership of the MPP, and especially Nanado and his team, to make sure that that giant step that we are talking about mm -hmm. must happen in our lifetime. We are only demanding economic empowerment opportunities for the North Thank you, in Kamba. our lifetime. I'll come back to you. Yeah. First of all, I think... think Kabo, the North should be proud of you, that at your level, youthful, but thoroughly and solidly committed to the cause of the North. And indeed, that brilliant exposition you've just given, against the background of what is at stake today, I am confident, and I sit here and say that, that the NDC, all things being equal, don't deserve one single vote from the North. Absolutely. Because Sada is a spectacular failure. Sada is a spectacular failure. Why do I say that? This is a program mm -hmm. for the development of the savannah areas, mm -hmm. focused to take on the best, deepen it, and empower the people. Agri-focused development, creating access to infrastructure, and empowering the people with education to take advantages and create the market as a hub, breadbasket for southern Ghana, as well as beyond. Nana Akufuado, the benefit of this background establishes a fund, one billion. That I am going to put down one billion to kickstart this process. Mm -hmm. And the government of Ghana passes the Northern Development Authority law. And 25 million cities is allocated. Then, for purely populist propaganda reasons, and the North must listen and appreciate what happened. Purely populist propaganda reasons. The then NDC campaign comes up and says, no, we own the North, we believe we are people, and we are telling you that these people are jokers, and if they have that kind of money, they should go and pay VRE debt, implying that we didn't have the money and we had lied. What does it turn out to be? They steal the idea and... In the normal context of things, when an idea doesn't belong to you, when a vision is not yours, when a dream is not yours, invariably you drive it into an abyss. You drive it into a ditch, typical of the NDC. They simply picked up this idea after ridiculing it two weeks later. They set up SADA. No vision, no commitment, no clarity, no clarity mm -hmm. nothing, just pure propaganda. So what happens? They go out there to the north, they sell this to the people that we are going to do this for you. And what was the distinction? When we said, oh, but this is the Northern Development Authority, they said, no, that's why you're limiting it to the three northern regions. We have brought it. 
into the savannah zone. Into, into the, the brown half full and then the Ashanti region. Yes. So childish. And yes. then some parts of the water region. No, pure populist propaganda. But you see, the trick is that, just like Cabo said, in this era, everybody is looking for development that is oriented towards their welfare. Mm -hmm. People want change of attitudes. The intelligentsia from the north want access, access in terms of infrastructure and opportunities, economic opportunities and social opportunities. So it is not enough any longer to simply lie to people about what you do for them. It is not enough any longer to go to the people and say, yes, I'm going to implement SADA. And then when you come into power, it takes you two years just to pass the SADA law. It takes you almost four years to put in a little over 30 million cities. Most of that money coming out of HEPIC funds. Many people don't know that the social investment fund, which was budgeted for SADA, is actually HEPIC renamed. So where was the government's commitment? Within that period, the government has prioritized and found it fit to pay 640 million cities in judgment debts. Where is the priority? That is the question. Where is the priority? Anybody in the north, and I'm proud that I've been associated with the north, I schooled there, I've traveled there extensively politically, I've met many, many people there, and I think they deserve the truth. The minimum they deserve is the truth. Mm -hmm. The gap is real. And interestingly, he also has some, some background of living, having, having lived in the north as a child. Yes. High school, I went to preparatory school in Bulgaria. Is it a coincidence that <laughs> we're, we're having such a discussion today? Absolutely. And you know, just to add to, to, to what he's saying, you know, if you look at what a lot of policy and, uh, and the literature says clearly that a, a lot of the import substitution policies that we implemented over our time, including the structural adjustment, really affected, you know, the development of opportunities in the north. Because today, what research has prov proven is that majority of the northerners who were hitherto, you know, anchored as a pool of labor to supply cocoa farmers have reduced mm -hmm. largely because of the trade liberalization policies we've had. And so it has even impacted it negatively on cocoa production. However, what that means is that it then comes back to the argument that it's important for government to take a deliberate policy. And it comes down to prioritization. Yes. For instance, in three years, this government has paid out 420 million US dollars in judgment debt. If indeed, like Bobby was talking about, the North was a major priority for the NDC. I don't believe that Northerners deserve the NDC or deserve to vote for the NDC again. For 20 years, the entire three northern regions have been so committed politically, electorally, to the NDC. What have they gotten in return? A slap in their face where they are talking about SADA. If indeed this government was so committed, why will you turn out 420 million American dollars, okay, when we needed just a half of that to throw up the entire north and open up the area and get infrastructure and agriculture and also strengthen the educational system in those areas. So we, I don't also believe that the NDC is being smart about their approach in terms of funding for the northern development. You cannot tie the development of or the destiny of the three northern regions to donor funding. You cannot go begging from UNDP, USAID, to develop the north. We are talking about making budgetary allocations to the north, and that is important. I believe that that point must be emphasized and driven home very strongly. We've had a thorough discussion of the historical antecedents of how the north has traveled through history, uh, through the history of Ghana. Yeah, we've been talking about the Northern Development Authority, the idea that the, NDC, uh, the MPP came up with, the fund that, that was, was created, uh, the laws to back it, and then the, the stealing of the idea and the promise of SADA and the semblance of what uh, the NDC seems fix to be doing with, 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 with SADA, which is pure propaganda on a daily basis. Monies that have been, uh, you know, are said to have been disbursed to SADA are repetitively, you know, 
uh, uh, put out there, uh, I had about some $18 million uh, sometime in September and was repeated sometime in December after, after the government or the president had gone to, to the United States of America. What does the NPP seek to do with the Northern Development Program? You see, before we go there, it's important that we let the public know mm -hmm. that there are specific things that this government promised to do with SADA. One, they were supposed to put in 200 million in seed money in 2009. Mm -hmm. It didn't happen. They were supposed to put in 100 million a year after that. So that by this time, we should have had 500 million in there. None of that happened. Now, if you compare that, 33.6 million that they have put in, instead of that 500 million, it's just 8.6 percent. Of how much they promised? They promised. Mm -hmm. Now, if you compare that to the Millennium Challenge account, fund mm -hmm. of a little over 500 million. 547 million. Compared to the $440 million they have paid out in judgment debts, at that time, 640 million cities. And what that fund has done, including things that the NDC is appropriating for itself, mm -hmm. boho projects, water projects in the north, that the NDC is appropriating for itself, that the Millennium Challenge account has achieved. Now, that lack of prioritization, is what the MPP is going to change. The MPP is genuinely committed to the development of the North, and it is going to be hinged on modernization of agriculture. Mm -hmm. Critically, once you modernize agriculture, then you will find that the spin-offs will include jobs, the spin-off will include social protection. So first of all, if you're modernizing agriculture, what do you do? You mechanize mm -hmm. agriculture effectively not just in terms of putting in the machines, but in terms of resolving access to land mm -hmm. so that the machines you put on there are in a position to work for the people. You, see, you, mu you must bring the development down to the people. You're not developing merely for development's sake. You're developing down to the people. So the other thing, once you put the machines on there, is that you must ensure year-round cultivation mm -hmm. because you have the river bodies passing through the north. All you need, and you have the land, which is appropriate. Which but is you quite have, fertile. It's flat, it's fertile. Mm -hmm. But it has only one rain-fed season a year. Mm -hmm. And then all the rest of the water drains away. So all you need is to put in dams. These are not huge infrastructure that you, but simple community-based dams that trap water, that are able to pick up water from the main river bodies and feed not only the farms in the seasons when there is no rainfall, but also the animals. Because you have a huge, huge, huge livestock base there as well. Mm -hmm. Then you go in, of course, for strategic crops. There are, there are crops that are subsistence, so for cash crops for sale, and then crops for feeding themselves. So you have the traditional crops like sorghum, which as we speak, is being developed heavily for the brewery industry in Ghana. And if you have reliable supplies, then it is likely that you're going to be able to take over the import of hops and malt and all those other things, and barley, feed and feed breweries the local breweries with sorghum. With sorghum. Yeah. Apart from being eaten there as well, mm -hmm. millet. And now all of us take cocoa in the mornings made of millet and sorghum. So you have that staple cash crop which they eat as well as sell. Mm -hmm. And then you have uh, uh, the rice, extremely important. The amount of rice that can be delivered from the north is unbelievable. Then you have the tomatoes, mm -hmm. where there's a factory that they are unable to push and push forward properly simply because they can't guarantee that the production. That was actually revamped by the, uh, the uh, Kufu administration. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. You know, and that they bragged that they had also revamped, but mm -hmm. they are unable to deliver. Okay. Then you have other crops capable of delivering opportunities for the people. So once you put that in, what next? You open the space for the private sector to follow you in. Mm -hmm. Because the private sector, once they realize that the northern approach, the northern project that the MPP is putting in mm -hmm. is going to benefit them, they will come in. But they won't just come in because of coming sick. Once they see that the government has taken the lead, infrastructure must follow. What infrastructure means? Doing road-specific, area-specific access points, marketing points, silos, mm -hmm. so that 
produce can be gathered, produce can be paid for at the farm gate, correct prices, and can be stored mm -hmm. and onwards sold without losses. And because the roads are there, and because the private sector, once you put the road there to the farm gate, we'll put a track on it, and we'll let money follow and go and buy the crops and evacuate them to market centers. So you have your storage component and you have your marketing component. Now, when you have that sorted out, you'll find that your produce is guarded effectively. Then the NPP is saying that the ultimate step then follows industrialization, mm -hmm. processing the material. Processing the material. Mm -hmm. So if you have the produce being effectively organized at grassroots level, families, irrespective of the size of their plots, are able to farm and they are able to get the inputs, they are able to get the market opportunities because you have created the roads to the farm gates and you have entrepreneurs who are buying and then you have the silos and these silos are also storing mm -hmm. then naturally you, you find attract, that there's a huge investment exactly into, into the exactly well, because you have stability you have stability in the output mm -hmm. imagine what will happen with school feeding if all these products were coming out and throughout the country we're feeding 4.5 million children That's a every huge. day Every day, you are feeding 4.5 million children. The granite production out there, the uh, uh, shear nut production out there, the, it's being turned into oils to feed these children. The rice is being uh, uh, sold straight into the schools. The vegetables are being canned and sold into the schools. That's on a daily basis. You are having to sell to a quarter of the people in Ghana. You well, yeah, I'll come, I'll, I'll come back to you. Kabo. There seems to be a certain fixation on building an actual headquarters for SADA before the NDC government, you know, takes off to do anything about, about the promise that they made to the people of the North. Well, you know, I mean, I keep saying, and I'm going to repeat it on this platform, I think that, you know, you see, the, the, the NDC has lost it. They've lost the concept, they've lost the moral high ground, and they've lost the whole idea or the agenda to transform the North. I mm. mean, why should the debate be about the headquarters? The headquarters of SADA mm -hmm. is for the people to see clearly the development that is expected from SADA. Not a building, not a structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I see the road from Navrungu, mm -hmm. okay, right up to Tumu, Tuwa, Tad, mm -hmm. infrastructure, that should be the headquarters of, of SADA. SADA. If I should see that the tomato industry in Tono and Via is being transformed mm -hmm. and the meat factory in Bolga is being transformed, okay? And I do see also that the guinea fowl industry, which mm -hmm. they are talking about in terms of agriculture and livestock production, is increasing. If I see also that government is taking specific intervention to make sure that fertilizer is available, like we have been talked about, mechanization of agriculture, mm -hmm. if I see the return of the combined harvester time, if I see the restoration of the traditional northern economy, which is largely agrarian, which we are seeing capital or private sector initiatives where advancements of credit uh, to smallholder farmers is in place, mm -hmm. then I can then be talking about the headquarters of, of SADA. Kabo. Well, um, I, I would like to say, just before you take your calls, that you know, 20 years of rapid economic development in Ghana, in fact, has done very little, if anything at all, to reduce the historical gap between the North and the South in terms of the standard of living. You know, and while rural development and urbanization have led to significant reduction in the South, similar dynamics have failed in the North. And it's important that if you look at the North, which is the sum total of the administrative regions of the Upper East, Upper West, and the Northern region, you know, you will see that it covers about 40% of the total land area of the country. And between 1992 and 2006, the number of poor in, the number of poor declined from 2.5 million in the South and increased by 0 0.1, 0 0.9 million in the North. A sharp contrast, you know, with the South. And there has been no significant decline in the proportion of poor in the population of the North. Indeed, mm -hmm. Ghana's success story in poverty reduction is a success story of the South. And so it brings us back to the important issue of huge government commitment. I believe, and I do know, having engaged the flag bearer and his running mate, 
that their major priority mm -hmm. for the North is to make sure that they have a budget allocation for Northern development. But not to allocate a budget, to make an allocation in our budget to pay $420 million. Kabo, let, let me bring in uh, viewers as well. Viewers, you can join us by calling 0302211701 and 0302211704. You can join us in discussion now. Yeah, if it wa was, we wait, we wait <coughs> for the calls. It's unfortunate that the government's strategy entirely appears to de depend on donors. See, a government that is bankrupt of ideas, a government that is bankrupt of leadership, a government that doesn't have a vision to bridge the gap between the North and the South, in spite of the fact that the government appears to be loaded with the intelligentsia from the North shows that indeed there is no clear commitment to the norm. Well, your boss and our number two man. Yes. Well, I'll come back to you. Hello, Daniel. Hello. Good evening. Good evening, Daniel. Welcome to Minority Caucus. Thank you. Yeah, I, I want to I want to welcome Mr. Well, it looks like we've lost Jeremiah Tamale. Hello, Jeremiah. Hello. Jeremiah, welcome to Minority Caucus. Thank you so very much. Good evening. Good evening. Let's hear you. And good evening to your panelists. Thank you. Let's hear you. Um, I am calling basically from the north, and then I want to share this idea with you. Um, we, I do recall that um, the Honorable Minister, Deputy Minister of Information, Abulakwa, did indicate some time ago mm -hmm. during the Yana Saga that we, the Northerners, should not, we shouldn't vote for them any longer because we cannot be voting for them and be threatening them with, their, with our votes. So they have failed and we shouldn't, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't vote for them anymore. So indeed, we have taken our own plans. We have advised ourselves on several occasions. And this time around, indeed, if you are a northerner or if you are a Dogomba and you go to, go to the polls and vote for the NDC, Master, your identity as a Dogomba is questionable because the Honorable Minister for Information did told us that um, we should not threaten them with, their, with our votes. Well, thank you very much. Sabiko. Hello. 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 Hello, Sabiko. Yeah. Welcome to Minority Caucus. Nice to hear you. Yeah, good evening. Good evening. Yeah, I thank my uh, panelists this evening for giving us the history of the, uh, the Northern region. We, the youth, still support the MPP and we'll continue to support it. And we hope that 2012, come 2012, MPP will win. And, uh, fulfill our promises, which has been filled by the current government. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Hello? Hello? Good evening and welcome to Minority Caucus. Welcome to Minority Caucus. Hello, good evening, sir. This is Fanny Lukolum from Laura. You're welcome. Um, You're honored. I want to thank Tony for his wonderful work he has been doing for the youth of the MPP, we appreciate what he has doing. Then we will be glad to hear more about him in future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Jojo. Hello. Hello. Hello, yeah. Jojo. Good evening. Yeah, good evening, sir. Yeah, I'm calling from Nadolish. And uh, I actually want to thank uh, our own man, Tony. Actually, we want him to come home and contest. We need people like them. <laughs> One thing is that if you go to work, these NDC people have spent a very big thing. Then they are building hospitals for us. Just of late, a gargantuan wind push the things down, and you can see that there's practically nothing inside that thing. So they cannot fail us, and they try, they try to you know, do propaganda with everything they are doing. Look, they should develop and stop showing up propaganda. That one will not send them anywhere. We are supporting everybody. I mean the MPP. Tony, we need you home. Come home and contest and save your people. Well, Bye. 
<laughs> Thank you very much. And that's a challenge to, to Tony Cabo. He's going to be pressed. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Yes. Your oh, boss has, uh, is an illustrious son of the North, uh, a technocrat, somebody with, with uh, an enviable track record. And he's leading the charge in making sure that the NPP sells this idea of the Northern Development Program for 2012. What are, the, what are the views that he's, he's, he's been expressing? You see, first of all, you have to look at it in the context of his own emotions when he was nominated. First thing he said was that there was and a And we have to be snappy because... Yes, there was a divide back. between the North and the South. Now, his commitment to the platform was that it wasn't for his own sake, but it was for the people of Ghana and especially to serve the people of the North in helping... NDPP to bridge that gap. He promises to help Nana to develop the entire country of Ghana holistically, but with special emphasis on the deprived areas in terms of, because when we bridge the gap, it will be beneficial not only for the North, but for the, the South as well and beyond. And beyond. Mm -hmm. So for me, the concluding thing is that as far as I'm concerned, the NDC has sacrificed the interests of the people of the North for political gain, personal political gain. They use them to secure votes so that they could come and pay themselves judgment debts. This time around, the people of the North should sacrifice the NDC, take their destiny into their own hands, and vote for progress, vote for development, vote for their son to lead the charge, as you said, to bridge that gap between the North and South. So that wherever you are in this country, you can proudly hit your chest and say, I am Ghanaian and I'm benefiting from democracy. And that would be a vote, certainly, for the NPP. Tony? Well, um, I mean, look, I will just end by recapturing the story told to me by my dad about the good old days. Mm -hmm. I believe that the youth of the NPP, the youth of this country, are demanding economic prosperity mm -hmm. in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. And we demand it now. Mm -hmm. We are looking for a leader who is committed to our cause a leader who is committed to making sure that graduates who leave our polytechnic, our universities, our training colleges will walk out of these institutions with jobs waiting for them. That is what we are demanding. And we are going to very soon, on this same program, on many other outlets, we are going to engage in what I call the call for a radical policy shift. And we are going to engage in a robust debate on policy on the way forward for this country because we have to make a critical decision in 2012 for the future of this country. You know, you don't realize if that happens, mm -hmm. Barry, and you have something like national service and you are posted to Laura, you'll be proud you'll to be see glad you'll and proud to go up there. Than yes. happy. Yes. You'll be more than happy to go because you have the transportation. It's simple. You have the communications. You can you watch TV there the same way as you watch it here, you will have the infrastructure, electricity, you will have the hospitals, you will have the schools, you can further your education, you have the postgraduate institutions, you will have everything, and you eat the same food that you eat in Hawaii or in Koko. You wouldn't have to Akra. complain. Well, but, you well know, thank one. you. We have to go. One. That's a quick one. We I have just to want go. to say thank you to the people of the North, the young people in the North who are committed to this party and are prepared to make a giant step to change the future of the North. Thank you.